I'm very pleased to announce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Litigus and I arrived the same week at Laurentian a few years ago. Uh, we've worked together on various projects. She actually spent some time in the US before coming back to Laurentian. Uh, she was, was maybe what would people consider a snowbird after she did her uh, masters at Guelph. She left to the US, but fortunately enough, she came back with her PhD degree, a postdoc and a husband uh, to Canada. Uh, she's been very a uh, star researcher for Laurentian. Uh, she's graduated many, many graduate students. Uh, she got a research award from the Faculty of Science and Engineering as uh, early as six months ago. Um, and she's done incredible work in conservation on one of the texts that we've not heard much uh, over this symposium, probably because it's a very long-lived species that we don't really see often dying and probably not thinking of some, some species that's going to go extinct because they live so long. But I think she's going to give a different light on the, the, the turtles that are in our environment. So uh, without further ado, Jackie is going to present her talk on the specific project of PB Island. Thank you, David. Actually, I'm not going to talk about turtles today, at least not specifically. Um, Today I'm going to tell you a story, a somewhat personal story, but I'm going to start, it's going to start personal, I'm going to tell you about my view of conservation and where I come from in my view in conservation, what influences me. Um, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about some legislation building on Marty's talk earlier in the symposium to set the context for the specific story of, of Pelee Island, which is again kind of a personal story. Okay. So I'm going to start with a prologue with a couple of quotes. I'm in a philosophy mixed audience, so I can do this. These are uh, two quotes that sit on my office door and have done for a few years. The pro-growth norms of global society foster timidity among conservation professionals, steering them towards conformity with the global economic agenda and away from acknowledging what is ultimately needed to preserve life on Earth. And another one that's a little bit more, again, personal. This is a quote by David Carroll from his book, Swamp Walker's Journal. He's a watercolor artist, but also an incredible natural historian who has a special passion for turtles. It is beyond ironic that we can all but never say no to the housing project, shopping mall, hotel, highway, golf course, or expansion of agriculture. But that after the habitat has been fragmented, funds, agencies, and groups can be drummed up to cage the final turtle nests relocate buckets of turtle eggs, fast forward hatchling turtles in aquariums, and then dump them into encircled habitat remnants. The most direct, simple, and viable solution to simply leave the place alone has no place in the debate. It's rarely a matter of whether or not a project is to go forward, but how it's gonna go forward with various token ecologically meaningless compromises and mitigations together with a management plan for the landscape we look to feel good when we should feel ashamed. <coughs> and I take this quote now from Graham Gibson from our round table that I think sort of frees me to make a confession to you. I do love turtles. <laughs> and I do love snakes. <laughs> and I think it is true in terms of reverence for nature, we can't save what we don't love. And I've loved these animals since I was a little kid. I grew up catching these things with my brother in my backyard. And that's the perspective I bring to you. So how I use that perspective. This, the research program that my students and I engage in is considering reptiles at risk. We study turtles, we study snakes, we study lizards, we study amphibians as well. And we take the, ta the, the stand that conserving biodiversity requires scientifically tested ways to ameliorate threats. Given David Carroll's quote, you know that development will happen. OK, I have to accept that. I'd rather not, but I have to. So what I'm going to do is try to put the best science behind that. And in line from what uh, Tom Nudds was talking about, I feel like we do put the hypothetical deductive in the science that we do in my lab. We test mitigation. We test it using hypotheses. We test recovery strategy, doc what's said in the recovery strategy. We test those strategies. That's what we do. 
And here's three quick examples to tell you about those, uh, to give you context for that. So uh, former graduate student in the lab, James Patterson, and this, this is talking about when the threat to the animal, to the turtles in this case, is mortality of gravid females, pregnant females, as they make their migrations to nesting sites. Oftentimes they encounter a road on that migration and they get hit and killed. And we know that gravid reproducing females and turtle populations are the cornerstone to viability. So what we can do is build an artificial nesting site that will intercept the female before she gets to the threat. And so what James did was test the efficacy of these mounds, and they work. They provide great incubation environment for turtles. Good. There's a potential solution to a problem. And then the work of Julia Riley recently finished in the lab. This is addressing a threat when the primary cause for decline may be subsidized predators who predate eggs and nests. And so we could put cages on those nests, and that's fine. That's a great contemporary band-aid solution to the problem, but there's a bigger problem that Julia identified, and that is, what are we doing to the hatchling fitness? And we don't know what that's gonna be for at least 10 or 20 years because it takes them that long to reach sexual maturity. So Julia's idea was to test whether or not these cages have any deleterious secondary consequences we may not have thought about. And she tested three different cage types, compared to controls, very scientifically rigorous study, to look at whether there was a fitness consequence. And the good news is, not really. We actually weren't presenting much of a secondary problem by caging turtle nests. Okay, there's another solution, perhaps, for that problem. And then another one that's a current project uh, by James Baxter Gilbert that uh, David and I are co-supervising. And this one addresses the threat of road mortality, which you heard about this morning, which is a, a pervasive threat. Roads are here, they're not going away, they're only getting bigger. So in the face of that infrastructure reality, what can we do to help offset the threat of road mortality? And so in this case, James is testing the efficacy of eco-passages to connect habitat fragments. Um, coupled with um, fencing to exclude animals from the road and essentially channel them into these eco-passages. So that's where I come from. So in Canada, um, we, we have tools to assist with the kind of science that I do, in my opinion. In the recognition of the uh, loss of biodiversity as a result of human threats, there is government legislation to help protect these species, and in key here, also their habitat. This is an important component. So I view that as, as progress. We can argue about that. There are some definite parts of it that are progress. We have a Federal Endangered Species Act, which you heard about, and we also have a Provincial Endangered Species Act, which has not been talked about yet. Okay, so what's the mandate of the, the Federal Act to prevent wildlife from becoming extirpated or extinct, to recover wildlife that are at risk because of humans, Manage species that are listed as special concern, protect residents for threatened and endangered species, and to also identify critical habitat for those species. And I tell you this again to emphasize the point that our legislation protects habitat as well as species. So to tell you what those definitions mean, just so you know, residence is a dwelling place such as a hibernaculum, a den site, where the animals return to habitually and spend quite a bit of time there. Critical habitat is the habitat necessary for survival and recovery of that wildlife species. In terms of the Provincial Act, the mandates are similar, of course, to identify species at risk based on the best available scientific information and also community knowledge and also Aboriginal traditional knowledge. To protect species at risk in their habitats, the thing about the ESA, that's, uh, I'll try not to talk in acronyms, it's a very Ontario thing to do, the thing about the Provincial Endangered Species Act is that it does apply on private lands. The Federal Endangered Species Act does not. It only applies on federal lands and in federal waters, which is quite a distinction that's important. Um, the mandate is to promote recovery of species at risk and to promote stewardship to assist in that protection. Okay, so how the system works. This is the sort of legal stuff I need to get you, give you this background before I move on to my story. So, no person shall kill, harm, harass, capture, or take a living member of a listed species. You can't transport or take any part, alive or dead, of one of those listed species. And again, importantly, you cannot damage the residents, the critical habitat, or the habitat for those species. Pretty powerful. And Marty talked about this earlier, so um, in terms of the implementation of this system, Species that maybe are, are at risk are uh, reviewed by a panel of experts. At the federal level, we have COSIWIC. At the provincial level, we have a, an analogous organization, COSARO, Committee on the Status of Species at Risk in Ontario, that um, perform in a, a similar fashion. 
So if a species is listed to be at risk, the government has responsibilities to provide, to commission a recovery strategy for endangered and threatened species and to commission a management plan for species that are listed as special concern. And I'm using capitals on those designations so you know that these are like official listing designations. But the next thing the government has to do is to respond to those statements. So the government has to respond to the strategy or the plan within nine months with something called a government response statement. And this is the working document. This is what the recovery is based on. So the government response statement uh, summarizes the intended actions and the priorities for recovery. And it also uh, distinguishes what will be the government-led actions and what will be the government-supported actions. So one of those government-supported actions and something that I think is uh, really important for the work that we do in my lab is there's money. There's actually money to do this species at risk research and to do it in a scientific framework, I would argue. So there's funding, um, and it's the com there are competitive grants that you apply for, um, and they're reviewed by a panel of experts that combine academia and government, depending on which grant it is. And the grants are awarded based on the proposed project's way to answer those recovery actions that are outlined in the government response statement. So that government response statement gives us a, a true framework to work from. Okay, and so at the federal level, just to tell you a little bit about it, there's the Habitat Stewardship Program, and my group's had some success obtaining those grants. There's an interdepartmental recovery fund, and then there's also uh, an equivalent for Aboriginal uh, Species at Risk, AFSAR, and my uh, research group's had some success obtaining those as well and building phenomenal partnerships with First Nations. And then at the provincial level, we have a Species at Risk Stewardship Fund. We also have a Species at Risk Research Fund. And then there are um, sort of incentive programs that are smaller grants. They're not research-based grants, but they're for local landowners to help them do some good stewardship. We've had some success with the stewardship and um, uh, research funds in this context. Okay, well, the system's not perfect, and I could give you a two-hour lecture on this part at least, and I won't, but I just want to give you a little bit of background. There are wrenches in the system. Last year, the Ontario government announced cutbacks of $50 million over three years to our Ministry of Natural Resources. For Americans, that's the same as your DNR, uh, Department of Natural Resources. Those cuts have been, uh, we're starting to feel them already. And we, other, we have another thing in Ontario, and I think this is actually really cool. We have what is called our environmental watchdog. We have the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, this is Gord Miller, and it's his job basically to keep an eye on MNR and what MNR is doing. So he <laughs> produces reports about that. So in 2009, he re released a report about our Provincial Endangered Species Act, which was enacted in June of 2008. So a year later, he provided this report entitled The Last Line of Defense, a re Review of Ontario's New Protections for Species at Risk. And in, in general, he applauded the province for doing this. But he also pointed out some of the, perhaps, problems. And one of those was he stated that the government response statements were inadequate because they offloaded responsibility from the government to somebody else. And I'm going to take the hat of, that's okay with me. I can get grant money to do my research. I'm okay with that offloading because I think, I'm going to say, us academics could maybe do a better job than the agency could because we can dedicate ourselves to that research and make it focused and produce good results. So I'm okay with that offloading. And then last week, um, the uh, Gord Miller released another report laying siege to the last line of defense, a review of Ontario's weakened protections for species at risk. So in July of this year, um, some revisions to the Endangered Species Act were announced that, that some are stating gut the act. What we had as a gold standard is now being dismantled and to the point where certain groups are actually taking the government to court and suing them over these changes. And so some of the statements that Gord Miller made in this with respect to this, where nearly half the required recovery strategies and government response statements have been delayed, so the government's not meeting its object, its what it said it would do, its commitment. But the main thing are these, the problem is these broad exemptions from activity that destroy habitats. So SAR means species at risk. So there are broad exemptions for things like forestry, aggregate extraction, blah, 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 things that you need to use to get permits to do that now you really don't need to. There's a lot of wiggle room. Um, and so that's a huge problem, and that's this gutting of the Act. And so his conclusion is that the new version of the Act is actually too flexible. It allows for too much development to happen in species at risk habitat. Okay, so that sets the context for now a story, a personal story I want to tell you about Pelee Island. 
So I've given you some background about where I come from and my approach to conservation, and I've told you some about the legislation to set the stage for this story about Pelee Island. So here you are on top of Georgian Bay. Sorry for the um, people from the other hemisphere. This is very North Central, North American centric. Here's Canada, here's the US. Okay, so here we are. Here's Pelee Island. Pelee Island is a, an island down in the uh, southwest edge of Lake Erie of the Great Lakes. Zoom in a little closer. Here it is, sitting below um, Ontario and uh, between above Ohio. Here's the island from aerial view. It's about 400, four hectares in size, which is about 10,000 acres. It has a suite of unique habitats. It has a great history, and I'm not going to go into all those details. There are more than 40 species at risk on the island, though, so it's a really important biodiversity place for Canada. 20% of the island is in nature reserve, which is fantastic for the animals. Uh, not four hectares. You have a four hectares. Oh, it's 10,000 acres. Mistranslation of my... So a little bit more about the island. It is the um, most southerly populated point in Canada. It's the largest of the islands in the Lake Erie Archipelago. About 200 year-round residents. Um, it's along two really important uh, bird migratory routes, so it's a great uh, place for people to come and watch birds. There are vineyards there, so there are wine tours, and it has an agricultural um, base. My interest is in the animals on the island. At least that's the perspective I came to the island with. Um, we have a, the island has a unique um, snake assemblage, including three species at risk. The blue racer snake, which is listed as endangered. This is the only place in Canada where the blue racer occurs. The Lake Erie water snake, also listed as endangered. And then the eastern fox snake, the subpopulation on Pelee Island is considered to be endangered as well. Let's give you some background about what we know about the snakes on the island. Um, there were occasional surveys conducted in the late 70s up until the early 90s. And then under the old legislation, before the ESA, the Endangered Species Act, uh, they were listed as an endangered species in 1991. And a blue racer recovery team was formed in 1992. And uh, they did surveys to determine if there were enough snakes on the islands to actually do an intensive ecological study to figure out and learn more about these animals. And so enter Ben Porchuk from 1993 to 1995, who did his master's thesis on the ecology of the blue racers under the supervision of Ron Brooks from the University of Guelph. This was a radio telemetry project and it provided incredible new data that we didn't know about these animals. And the asterisk is there to indicate that I volunteered on um, that research. I would go in the summers and help uh, Porchuk out now and then. And then he received some funding to do a hybrid, uh, study specifically looking at hibernation of blue racers and fox snakes. And I also uh, was paid as a technician on that project. So I have a personal attachment to Pelee Island and its snakes as well. And then subsequent to uh, Porchuk, Rob Wilson did his master's thesis on the thermal ecology of fox snakes, but he also continued to, uh, from Pelee Island, but he also continued to do surveys for blue racers on the island. Uh, Wilson started out as Porchuk's field tech and then just rolled through. And then uh, Wilson proposed this uh, format of doing systematic surveys that were conducted in the spring over a three year period and then with that report, he then suggested to the Ministry of Natural Resources that these surveys should be conducted at some period of time into the future to keep tabs on how these snakes were doing. And then also, um, Jeff Hathaway and colleagues did informal surveys um, over weekends, uh, May 2 4 weekend, uh, that's it, Canadian speak, May 2 4 weekends, our first long weekend of the summer, they would go do surveys. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> now to get to the heart of the matter, or at least the start of the heart. Um, animosity over snakes. So in 1998, the Ministry of Natural Resources hired Porchuk to go do surveys on the island um, to map, not surveys, to map species at risk habitat for snakes on the island. And then from those, and th this, these surveys were done under the auspices of, of tax breaks for your property. If you have species at risk habitat, you'll get a tax break. At least that's what was stated. And then shortly after that, the Ministry of Natural Resources announced that snake habitat could not be touched. So if you had blue racers on your property, you could no longer build a shed, etc. Extreme restrictions under the old legislation. Well, as you might imagine, the people were not happy about that. People began to willfully destroy their habitat, and they also attacked Ben Porchuk. They slashed his tires, they threw rocks through his windows, 
he had property on the island, he had 55 acres on the island, and he sold them in 2004 and left, because after seven years of being attacked, he was ready to go. Actually, he didn't get attacked in the beginning, it was later on after the 1998 scenario that he left. And the islanders were very upset, and they put signs all over the island that said no MNR, no Ministry of Natural Resources in 2003. And so the problem here, at least in some people's opinions, is that there was no flexibility in that old legislation, and so the Ministry of Natural Resources failed the stakes, and I would argue also failed the people. Um, the new, so then the new Endangered Species Act came into play, and again was enacted in 2008, and it provides for something called overall benefit, wherein if you apply, used to be if you applied for a permit, apparently not anymore, but if you applied for a permit, you could destroy species at risk habitat as long as you promise to sort of replace it somewhere else or provide an overall benefit to that species in, in some other way. Um, so to me, what that would mean is hope for the islanders, that they could actually do something, that there's a little bit more flexibility perhaps in that um, legislation now. So, um, oh, <laughs> I forgot about this quote. There is, so when the new ESA was put into place, because of this animosity and this sort of terrible history, um, there was this quote floating around, if it can work on Pelee Island, it can work anywhere. And you can imagine what that would make the people feel like on the island. It did not make them feel good to know that they were this case study. Okay, well, so that's what happened before, and then, you know, 10 to 15 years had passed. I had been dreaming of returning to Pelee Island to work on those snakes. And so I thought maybe um, enough time had passed, maybe the issue had blown over, maybe everything was okay now. Um, and from my scientific side of the brain, the mandated recovery had not been done. Those surveys were supposed to have been done five years ago, they weren't repeated, et cetera. So I thought maybe there's enough time that we could go back and do something about this. So I catch this idea to Julia Riley, who had just recently finished her MSc in my lab, as she would be the perfect candidate to be able to infiltrate a small community and, and do some science on these snakes um, because of her experience working with First Nations. And also, I just wanted to keep her. So we engaged multiple partners in the project. The Laurentian University was on board to support Julia through her PhD. The Ministry of Natural Resources was on board with us doing this. Nature Conservancy Canada, phenomenal partner in our project, um, who would provide us lands to work on, and who would pro provide us with accommodations to sleep in and cook in while we were there. Um, and the previous snake researchers, Porchuk, Wilson, and Hathaway, were all consulted and all part of the development of this project. And everybody was cool with that. So I wrote a grant proposal to that Species at Risk Stewardship Fund that I told you about, Population Ecology and Effectiveness of Mitigation, mitigation for Species at uh, Risk Snake Assemblage on Pelee Island. Just, I'm not going to go into the project details because that's not the point of what I want to tell you today, but I'm just going to give you a, a quick outline of context that's important. So we were going to assess the changes in the demographics of those snake populations by doing those surveys. We were going to test some mitigation strategies. There was evidence of road mortality and some other things, and we were going to test some of those things. But the key that you need to know is that the four study areas, these, they're highlighted here with these yellow boxes, all four of them are not private land. They're all already in nature reserve. I wouldn't, we wouldn't have to go on anybody's private land. So the key thing about that project did not require access to private land. Well, good news. I got the Species at Risk Stewardship Front uh, Fund grant, over $68,000 to support this project, three years. Yay, how exciting. But Julia and I discussed this, and given the history and the animosity, we decided we needed another, we needed another partner on board for this project. So, we jumped on the ferry, we, we drove seven hours from Sudbury down to Leamington, then we got on the ferry, well, and in between we stopped at NCC and talked to them about our strategy, and we, we did this. And we went down to Pelee Island to talk to the town council. So we decided, we made a pact, <laughs> that uh, we would not do this project if we couldn't get the council's support, if we couldn't get the island's support. Given that history, we didn't want to subject ourselves to the risks and the science to the risks. Um, so we created a PowerPoint presentation that we were going to give to council during a town council meeting. And in that presentation, we introduced ourselves, we introduced the project briefly, and we also said to the council, what would you like from us? What benefits can we provide for you? We did a one-page handout and then some discussion ensued. It was, what, five or ten minutes of our time in the council. And when we left that meeting, we had no answer. What happened in the meeting 
was it, it, two of the council members were not supportive of what we wanted to do. And this was a quote that came from one of those members. We are the endangered species. So because of the history and how they felt about how species at risk were interfering with their ability to move forward with economy on the island, they felt they were the species at risk and that they were being ignored. So then the mayor, Rick Moss, who thanked us a million times for coming down and making this trek to the island to discuss our project with them. He invited us to the tavern after for a beer and he wanted to talk to Julia and I some more and to, and to help move the project forward. It was clear that he was supportive and wanted to help us move forward. So we, we met with him and we talked about what other things um, would be useful to submit for the next council meeting that he would present on our behalf because we simply couldn't make that kind of a trip again to do it ourselves. I think we were both out of town during the next council meeting. Um, but, you know, I thought this, this was great. The mayor is totally on board and um, the, the, the city plan, the development plan for the city says, yes, we want to do economic growth for our population, but we also recognize our biodiversity. We don't we just want to save it, we want to enhance it. And we're like, okay, you know, if we can do this, we can answer the mayor's concerns, we should be good. So more materials. So he wanted a more detailed project proposal that talked about implications of our research for the island. And one of the council members, one of the two that were uh, unsupportive, specifically requested a letter from the Ministry of Natural Resources guaranteeing no ill effects to the islanders for the research we would do. I'm like, that's a tall order. I don't know if we can do that. Well, I contacted Joe Crowley, who's the species at risk herpetologist for the Ministry of Natural Resources, and he talked to his bosses and lickety split, he got that for us, which was amazing. The information, and this is the letter he wrote to me to provide to the Pele Council, a piece of that letter. The information that you collect would not result in the expansion of protected snake habitat. The collection of additional species occurrence data would not result in changes to existing habitat protection to those properties or e even nearby private land. Right. Slam dunk. We got this, right? Nope. This is the letter that I received from town council the day after the mayor presented our package to the council. I regret to advise you that council has declined to support your project on the island. Unfortunately, past experience with snake research has left council with serious concerns about potential harm to the island economy that could result from your project. I trust you will understand this is a very sensitive issue here and council is acting only from an abundance of caution. So I gave the money back and now Julia is looking for another PhD. Obviously, I'm very disappointed about this. This is a letter from June. This is a recent occurrence. Okay, well, <laughs> What did we learn from this? Well, <laughs> lots of things I could say, but I'll um, try to provide some advice, I guess, or just talk about what happened. So one of the clear messages is a, is a, is a problem of communication in this context. And it, what's interesting is, so the title of my talk had to do with legislation, but you know, the legislation's not actually the problem in this case. The problem in this case is appropriate communication about the legislation. I don't even think the people on the island know the details because nobody's gone to bother to tell them about it. Nobody's talked to them. And a, a clear outcome of this is how long-lasting and festering this situation can become. It's been 15 years, and those people are still very upset. And in my mind, Julia and I did the things we were supposed to do. We tried to engage those stakeholders. Uh, and I'll come back to that point. And um, local landowner involvement in stewardship, right? This is the key to doing this kind of work. But what do you do when there's uh, historical, historical stakeholder disengagement? So Tom Nudd's term about stakeholder disengagement. There was this thing that happened in the past. How can we fix it? How could we have done something differently to try and solve that problem? So one of the things that Julia and I discussed in, when thinking about it is that perhaps what we should have done is instead of writing the grant first and then going to council, we should have engaged council and the people in helping us to write the grant. Maybe that would have helped it a little bit. It's Tom Nudd's has given me the thumbs up. And so in light of this, under the um, advice of the former science director for the Nature Conservancy of Canada, John Riley, Julia and I, under his advice, um, have put together a package that's going to the big cheeses in the MNR, it's going to the big cheeses at Nature Conservancy, and it's going to the mayor, and it includes the chronology of all these events that happened to us, our story, but it's also got, it includes a cover letter that suggests you people need to talk to each other, basically, in a much more polite way. But 
it suggests that perhaps it's time to get a discussion going. Perhaps it's time for the local islanders and the Ministry of Natural Resources to talk to each other about this scenario. And in terms of this is a, a story, but it can't be unique. I'm sure there's got to be other cases where this has been the case, where stakeholder engagement, disengagement has become the problem. And now we have mandated recovery that's not happening because of this. So when I told this story to uh, Margaret Atwood and Graham Thompson, uh, Graham Gibson um, over uh, dinner, they have property on the island and they have an investment in the island. And they said to me, you guys should have just gone ahead and done it. You weren't going on anybody's private land. You were staying on Nature Reserve. But Julia and I had already made this pact that we would not do that because we think that that, was, that would be the wrong move in this particular case because of the animosity from the history. We didn't want to, again, subject the science to that. We didn't want to subject ourselves to that scenario. I didn't want to send Julia down to the island to get run off the road by angry people or have her tires slashed. I wasn't going to do that. And so again, the story is probably not unique, and I think the bigger message is we need to do this right if we want to save these species. And on a personal level, it was the first time where I actually questioned my stance in conservation. I haven't changed it, Jeff, don't worry. <laughs> I, still take, I still will take a hard stance to protect the animals because in my view, somebody has to, and I feel like that's me, and I'm gonna do that because I do love the animals, and that's why I do it. But it also made me stop to consider the impacts of lack of communication, of legislation, of us and them, agency versus people, impacts on people, and that we do have to consider that. And there. <laughs> and here, a plant, because we've been completely ignoring these animals for the animals, these <laughs> <laughs> organisms. This whole time. Just a very emotional story. Uh, questions? In the Willamette Valley in Oregon, where, where I live, uh, the, there are a number of endangered and threatened species that are associated with uh, the uh, oak habitat there. Uh, oak savanna, yeah. which is maintenance-dependent ecosystem. So uh, if it's not burned, or laboriously hand weeded, then it will very quickly grow up in dug fur, which will shade out the oak. And most of the oak savanna that remains is on private land. This creates a, a very interesting situation because landowners, private landowners who are afraid of potential restrictions on their land need do nothing for the habitat to disappear. Mm -hmm. Right? They just let the dug furs grow up and yep. those pesky little uh, species, those butterflies and other things that people are so concerned about, well, they'll just have to go elsewhere. Uh, and one of my graduate students studying this has argued that putting land use restrictions in place in a situation like that is probably the worst thing that you can do for the endangered species. Hmm. And he's argued and this is, of course, a very tricky issue, but he's argued that probably leaving things alone and trusting to those landowners that will, uh, because of their own interest in preserving species, maintain those habitats, rather than having land use restrictions on private land, will probably have a better net effect overall. Now, in the situation that you're describing, of course, this is not maintenance dependent habitat. But it does sound like... The it is somewhat, actually. Okay. Nature, Nature Conservancy is making efforts to maintain some of the open savanna okay. habitats that are required. So maybe it's even more parallel than I had imagined. But, I mean, this would suggest that maybe it really is the legislation that's the problem and not the communication, because it does create uh, a certain system of, uh, of costs and benefits that will encourage landowners to destroy those habitats, whereas no legislation might actually have left a lot of that habitat alone or created opportunities for collaborations that would have maintained it. So I wonder what your thought is about that. I don't know. So the, the animosity here is so great because of what happened before, and I can't change that. That's before my time on the island. And I don't know that we could leave the stewardship in the hands of the islanders because they're so angry still. I just don't know. <laughs> 
And one thing I wanted to actually just to mention, uh, the 10 percent of the island that's in nature reserve, um, and I mentioned that thing about overall benefit in the new act, the island is upset, the council is upset, the mayor's upset, that they are getting no recognition for putting their own potential lands that could have been used for development into nature reserve, which means they lose about uh, $200,000 a year in tax revenue that they now can't gather. And for a tiny little municipality, that $200,000 a year is huge for their day-to-day -day activities, their budget. And so they're frustrated that they're not getting, so they understand the legislation to that respect, but they just, you know, they're not even getting credit for that overall benefit that they've done. They put quarry lands into conservation reserve for snakes. Tommy, I want to congratulate you on a great talk. Thanks, Tom. That's the Yours is also the story of moving here and moving timber companies. Of Lake Ontario, who had fisheries guys who were trying to do something for uh, mitigating turtle bycatch. Uh, Bob Links and Hayfield from farmers and so forth. It, your story is playing out in so many different ways that you know it, it suggests there's a substantive core issue here. And part of it is part of it's the legislation, part of it is also the communication. Um, it's, it's a combination of things. And I'll tell you just a, a short story. I mean I, I had an invitation to go to the, the most sort of right wing uh, landowner organization in the province and talk about the Endangered Species Act. My talk was the importance of landowner engagement in conserving species at risk. Okay, these 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 this organization that chases them and our guys out the door, right? But what did I get from the from some elements of the Anglo community? I my computer was melting down with the emails. What are you doing, Tom? You've been duped into this right wing sneaky attack on the Endangered Species Act. How dare you go talk to those people? Right? This problem of communication comes from all sectors. Absolutely. And there's a lot of responsibility needs to be taken in all, all those dimensions. And I feel like we did all the things, like, most of the things that we could have done to be open and honest about that, and that was our intent. I mean, you, you, did, I mean, you, you did great, I think. In, in the, in the attempt to make, you're making the most of your story to advance things. Um, if you think you want to go back in there, um, I, I would. Uh, I mean, I, I I I would like to talk to some more about the techniques of uh, expert elicitation and ways that there's a whole literature on this business now of uh, eliciting expert knowledge from stakeholder communities in a in a fashion that feel, you know they they're more engaged in the actual decision making say, development of the proposal. This is the same thing we know we're, we're legislating <coughs> for, for Aboriginal communities, right? There's a consideration. You, know, you, you have to have them involved from the start. You don't show up with a proposal and say, how do you like us now? Right? Right. And there's, in this particular case, there's a there's definitely a comparison to First Nation communities. This is an island, and this is a very insular community, and there, it, it's very similar to that scenario that that may make it different than some of the other scenarios you're talking about, like Bob Link, etc. We have a, a very defined little space of people that are that don't. So they have this view of us and them. It's you know very much present in this this particular story that changes the playing field. Do you want a question? Yeah. Um, yeah. So first of all, I'm very sad. sorry about your, your story. It does make me very sad and makes me a little angry. I'm sorry about that. But but I think that it's illuminating in a lot of respects. And I want to kind of I want to push back on this idea that it's simply a problem of communication. I mean, I agree that it's a problem of communication, but I may be hearing that a little differently than than you do. That is that um, you know when you're quoting Graham Gibson and saying that well you know uh, you can't say something you don't love, one might think that the problem of communication is that you just aren't communicating the value or the importance of whatever it is that you're looking to conserve. And I think the real issue in this case, if I can just offer this as a diagnosis, kind of, I mean, and the real issue is that you know these people. I think you did the right thing by going to them, but I think they were—they have not been a part of the conservation conversation for quite a long time. Absolutely. And so, and so the communication problem is a breakdown of, of channels and of permissions, right? Not a breakdown of like failing to uh, communicate value, right, or communicate why this is important to them or why they should take an interest in this and so on. And this is an error I think the conservation community and even the philosophical community very often makes, right? Mm -hmm. They just think, if we just hammer down this point that basically it's important for the species to survive or the, for this habitat to, to, 
prevail, then we'll, we'll win, right? But I don't think that's true, right? It really is about making sure that there are channels for communication. That's got to be at least an important focus of the conservation. It, so I hear what you're saying, Ben, and in, in terms of value in this situation, I feel like we lost our chance in some ways to, to make that argument about value because these snakes have been devalued because of the animosity that happened. And I don't, my question is how do we fix that? It certainly needs fixing, but how do we fix it? Do we wait for the next generation of people? And in fact, the two fellows that were, at least one of them, that were unsupportive of the project when Julia and I went there, he was actually a little kid that played hockey with Porchuk when Porchuk was there. You know, so this is the next generation and it's still festering. So how do, you know, he was a kid then, he thought the snakes were cool, but now he's, you know, if I reported that accurately, Julia, I mean, that was. There's a question in the phone. Yes, yeah. uh, So it is a fascinating story. And I'm sort of drawn to the fact that there were only two who really opposed it, and that there were others who were quite happy to have it go ahead. And so in a way, we don't know from your story, and I don't know if you know, to what extent the snakes were kind of proxy for other community politics that were being played out. But one approach always can be to go back to people who are supportive and say, what can we do to help you? Um, and we did. Yeah. I mean, at least at that council, so in the end, there were, so at the first presentation that Julia and I made, there were two out of five people who were unsupportive. And there was no vote or anything, but it was clear by their comments. That, and also at the tavern after they were there as well and threw some comments around that were very negative. Um, but when it went to the vote, there were five members voting and those two guys plus one other person. So it was three against and two in favor of the project. I don't know, do I throw in the towel? No, I mean, <laughs> it's, a pretty close, it's a pretty close thing. We don't know the internal dynamics. Uh, there is a sense in which that kind of self-righteousness um, gains a higher ground somehow. I'm not sure how. I was trying to analyze some of that in my paper. But um, in the same way that we know that the people at the front line of conservation uh, practice need our support, uh, not because they need our education or anything. They probably have plenty themselves. But they're doing hard work. They need support. And the same for, for the... Uh, the people who are your potential allies there. What, what can be done to support them? So maybe when we went to the island, we should have talked to the right, to the people, not just the council too. And that's something else that we've talked about. I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. You come up yeah. with all kinds, of, but we thought we were doing the right thing. Of course, yeah. And also, I think now with that's family, Julia. One of, the, <laughs> this is what, one of our allies when we're on the island with the mayor. And yes. The goals of the mayor that he has is to use to try and open communication with MNR and try and work with them in order to figure out how to create sustainable developments so that the island can go ahead with their economic development as well as considering species difference. So that's something that it was one of his desires to have all these in, in when he's in office. And so by we have now been putting together this package and that is in order to help him reach that goal. So that's one of our allies there. So we're really, like, Jackie and I necessarily haven't given up on the project. We're still trying to move it forward, but I think this is one of the, now it's, it needs to go beyond just us yeah. to actually create something of a resolve, and then hopefully, maybe that will move forward, who knows what will happen in the future, but we are, we are staying, sticking with our allies on that. Yeah, absolutely, and, it, and trying to start a discussion with the people that maybe can't truly fix it. Time is moving. I'm taking the last question from the front of you. Many hands, but we we'll use the coffee break for that. That's an amazing story. Thanks. <laughs> that. And, um, so I was wondering about another dimension, whether it's possible that part of the story is the fact that it is about snakes, who have this very sort of, you know, unenviable uh, distinction of being, <laughs> uh, often being hated and being directly killed. And yeah. In a lot of places in the world, snakes are declining. From direct from persecution. Yeah. So the idea that you know that the people were sort of blocked from from you know being allowed to kill snakes, whether this has a role. So this is just one aspect, but I also wanted to ask whether one possible strategy to approach it would be to make the study about something more general. So in other words, to come at it more indirectly, but not insincerely. <laughs> that you're you know looking at habitat or looking at other animals and plants and uh, ecological relations that involve the snakes and that way 
you know, you get to come out to snakes, but not, you know, it's not about the snakes. Um, it, um, so just adjust our sales pitch. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, not to the granting agency, because that's specifically about the stakes to address the recovery of the stakes. But it, our partner in Nature Conservancy, who has a much broader mandate to restore habitats for multi-functions, multi-purposes, we were working with them in that regard. But yes, our focus was the stakes, and that is how we sold it. I don't know if I, I don't know if there's a historical dislike of snakes on the island. I don't. No. There isn't. Yeah, I didn't think yeah. so. Yeah, the, the, the snake, these snake islands are historic islands. They yield the sermon. Uh, that's right. They can find 500 snakes in a day on the island at the right time of year. These these people are used to snakes. They like snakes compared to other parts of Ontario. They think snakes are wonderful creatures, uh, and they don't think them with shovels and stuff like that. Old guys, even when we were there, came up and talked about how awesome the snakes were. So. They also have a line, so snakes, you know, are kind of helpful for rodents. <laughs> <laughs> But I also think, I think honestly from my point of view, it would have been dishonest of me to say that we weren't working on snakes, and I wanted to be as honest as possible. Because of the because mistrust. Because I would have been working on snakes. The core I of the problem is mistrust, right, between Ministry of Natural Resources and the people towards the Ministry of Natural Resources. We what about the great fox? I don't, the great fox story too. Right? There is, and I don't know that story, I know of it, but, but I don't if know it. was the great fox. If it was the great fox, it might have been different. We're going to pour some coffee on those stories and we're going to raise your hand.